This is your host Danny and this is series from English Plus podcast. Well, the good news is that series is back and we're not back with only one series. We're back with three different series. Today we're going to start with the first one. Well, actually it's not a new series because I already started that a long time ago and I never got to finish it. For the ones who've been listening to English Plus for some time, you knew about the 100 events that changed the world. We talked about 40 events, but since we're talking about 100 events, so there are 60 events to go. Today we're going to talk about the next 10 events. So today we will complete the first 50 events that changed the world. For those of you who haven't heard of the series before, you can check older episodes to find the first four episodes of the series, 100 events that changed the world. And to make this easier, I made something different on my website. If you go to my website, the link is in the description, of course, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. There is a way to choose your episodes by topic. And, of course, one of the topics is series. But there are other topics as well. There is vocabulary building, literature, grammar, business, all the topics that we have. So if you're interested in one of the topics and you want to track all the episodes I created on this specific topic, you can go to my website and choose the topic you like. And that will take you to a page where you will see all the episodes on that specific topic. So that is about today's episode, and we have a lot to talk about for today. We have 10 events, Mercator's projections and how it revolutionized navigation. Then we will continue to talk about the English Renaissance and the Bard. Then we will talk about the Counter-Reformation that brings a new art and the age of Rembrandt. And then we will talk about the arrival of tea in Europe and how that changed the world. Well, you might say tea, well, that actually changed the world. You will see how. And after this one, we will talk about the royal roots of opera and ballet. Then we will talk about the Bible that gets a new translation. Then we will talk about the Taj Mahal monument. And after that, we will talk about Galileo on trial. We will also talk about Tasman exploring the great Southland. And finally, our 50th event that changed the world is going to be about Newton when he published his famous laws in Principia. So, 10 events to talk about, 10 of the 100 events that changed the world. Today's episode, as I told you, it's going to be from event 41 to 50. And don't forget, this week we're going to start two different series as well. One is going to be about the 100 greatest mysteries. We will talk about those mysteries. That's going to be a very exciting series. And there's the third series that talks about things you need to know about your brain and body. So let's stick to our topic today and to our series today. And let's talk about 10 events that change the world. But before we start, let me remind you that there's a link in the description of the episode that will take you to the custom post I created for this episode where you will get to have an overview of those 10 events, but more importantly, a comprehension check questions, a quiz if you want to check your understanding of what we talked about today. So while you're learning something new, why don't you take it as practice to make your English and comprehension and even listening better? So you can take this link, go to the custom post I created on my website, englishpluspodcast.com. And there's the second link, the more important link for the time being. And that is the link that will take you to my Patreon page. If you want our learning community to continue, there's only one way to do that. And that is by supporting each other. I need your support. The whole learning community needs your support. Take the link, go to Patreon and become a patron of our learning community. It's your contribution that keeps this thing going until we get to a point where we can become completely independent. And now, without further ado, let's start with our very first event for today, Mercator's Projections Revolutionized Navigation. That's coming next. This event happened in 1569. Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator, who lived between 1512 and 1594, published an important map of the world in 1569. The map was based on the Mercator projection, which combines equally spaced longitude lines with latitude lines that become wider apart the farther away from the equator. Instead of having to take compass readings again and again to stay on track, the Mercator projection allowed seafarers to plot their course using straight lines and led to accurate navigational charts. Although the Mercator projection distorts the size of lands near the poles, it has been used in maps ever since. 
In 1570, fast on the heels of Mercator's world map, his fellow Flemish cartographer, Abraham Ortelius, who lived between 1527 and 1598, published Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, which is considered the first modern atlas. He appended a list of sources acknowledging the work of the cartographers, including Mercator, from whom he had drawn for his atlas. So, that was our first event, but don't go away. We have the next event coming up, and this is going to be an exciting one because it will talk about the English Renaissance and the Bard. And guess who? Shakespeare is going to be here. So, that's coming next. Stay tuned. Well, that event did not happen in a specific year. It happened over a period of time from 1589 to 1614. Just as great Renaissance artists like Leonardo da Vinci can be said to transcend their era, so too William Shakespeare is held to be a writer for all time. He was the first man of the English Renaissance, which usually dates somewhere from the late 15th to early 17th century. The humanist and classical focus of the period can be seen in many of his plays, like Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. And the Renaissance's utopian ideals shine forth in the tempest. His attention to the human condition, his interest in all aspects of the world, and the joy he found in his native language make Shakespeare an exemplary Renaissance man. A professional actor, as well as a playwright, he was a member of an acting company known as Lord Chamberlain's Men, sponsored by Elizabeth I's Lord Chamberlain. Many of his plays were performed at the Globe Theatre in London, which has become nearly as famous as Shakespeare himself. He bought shares in the Globe when it was built in 1598. The Globe was a three-story amphitheatre about 100 feet in diameter and held 3,000 spectators who would stand to watch the performance in an area called the Pit or sit in stadium-style seats. A rectangular stage, known as an apron stage, jutted out into the middle of the open-air yard. It had trap doors that allowed actors to enter and exit from below. Elizabeth I, the great queen of England, who lived from 1533 to 1603, did not attend the Globe Theatre in person, but the actors would perform plays at her court. Shakespeare's career flourished in part because of the support he received from the Queen after she came to power in 1558. Her successor, James I, also supported the Bard through his patronage of Shakespeare's acting troupe. From 1589 to 1614, Shakespeare wrote at least 37 plays, the first of which is believed to be The Two Gentlemen of Verona in 1589. Most of his early plays were comedies, including A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Merchant of Venice, or histories such as Henry VI and Richard II. In 1595, he wrote his first tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, and it, along with Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, and Hamlet, are the works for which he is most revered. Their multidimensional protagonists broke the mold of well-drawn but predictable characters usually found in Renaissance drama. Known for his poetic language, Shakespeare coined such terms as sea change, good riddance, and foul play. Today, we still use expressions of his invention, love is blind, beware the Ides of March, and come what may. All these were coined by Shakespeare, or were used first by Shakespeare, and we still use them today. Arguably the most celebrated writer of all time, his work continues to be performed around the world. He has inspired modern theatrical works inspired by Romeo and Juliet and Kiss Me Kate inspired by The Taming of the Shrew and movies including Forbidden Planet inspired by The Tempest and O oh, inspired by Othello. And these are contemporary retellings of some of the Bard's more famous plays. So that was about Shakespeare. That was about the Bard and the English Renaissance. Now let's move to art and talk about the age of Rembrandt and the Counter-Reformation that brings new art and, obviously, Rembrandt. That's coming next. That also didn't happen in a specific year. It happened in the 1500s and the 1600s. 
In response to the Protestant Reformation started by Martin Luther in 1517, the Catholic Church launched the Counter-Reformation during the mid-1500s to 1600s. This period of Reformation saw a revival of the Inquisition and the Thirty Years' War, which raged from 1618 to 1648 and involved most of Europe. The Catholic Church also corrected abuses of power and ignited Catholic devotion through schools and missionaries. Art also became a focus for the Catholic Church, which decided art should serve to inspire the public's faith in the Church. The Baroque style that evolved from the Church's art program was paradoxical. Religious images became more accessible because of the artist's naturalistic treatment of them, while dramatic effects were used to convey the splendor of the divine. One of the most prolific Baroque painters was Dutch artist Rembrandt Harmenzoon van Rijn, who lived between 1606 and 1669. His blinding of Samson, created in 1636, dramatically depicts the biblical story of Samson and Delilah. The painting's theatricality is enhanced through his use of light and dark to add drama, a technique known as chiaroscuro. It is also an example of his brilliant technical mastery of form, color, and light. Rembrandt was deeply religious, and so in his self-portrait, he depicted himself as Saint Paul, perhaps to suggest he wished for less division among Christian sects. So, that was the event, and now for the very next event, and a very interesting one, and that is about tea. Tea arrives in Europe and changes the world. Imagine that, but that is exactly what happened in 1602. That's coming next. So that event happened in 1602 when a Dutch East India Company ship arrived in Europe carrying tea from Macau early in the 17th century. It brought with it a Chinese habit. The Chinese began cultivating and using tea around 2000 BC. Once established in Europe, tea became an important trading commodity and the drink of choice for many Europeans. In 1602, the Dutch government granted the Dutch East India Company a 21-year monopoly to carry out trade in Asia. Around the same time, Britain gave the East India Company a royal charter and the exclusive right to trade in India, the East and Southeast Asia. The companies competed for the right to trade with the various Eastern empires. In addition to tea and coffee, they imported spices, cotton, silk, indigo, and later opium. Like the Silk Road, these companies linked East and West and are early examples of globalization and imperialism. They often held quasi-governmental powers, helping form colonies for their home countries. So, that was about the tea. You didn't think tea would be that important in the history of the world, but it was. Well, it is important today, but it is not as important as it was over 400 years ago when it first came in Europe and started the domination of this famous, or maybe I should say the infamous, East India Company. And now, that was about the tea arriving in Europe. Let's move to the 45th event that changed the world. And we'll move back to talking about art and music, and this time we will talk about opera and ballet, the royal roots of opera and ballet. That is about 1607. That's coming next. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Looking to enhance your English skills while exploring a world of knowledge? then English Plus Podcast website is just for you. Dive into diverse topics ranging from science to literature, history to business, and myths to modern insights. Each episode from our podcast or article from our magazine is a journey of learning and discovery, designed to not only improve your language skills, but also broaden your understanding of the world. Join us at English Plus Podcast where language meets limitless learning. Tune in today and take your English to the next level. Visit EnglishPlusPodcast.com to start your journey. English Plus Podcast, language, learning, enlightenment. Never stop learning with English Plus. (music) 
So that happened in 1607. The first opera ever written was Daphne by Italian composers Jacopo Peri and Jacopo Corsi, which debuted at Corsi's Palazzo in 1598. Almost a decade later, L'Orfeo, composed by Italian composer Claudio Monteverdi, was written for the carnival in Mantua, where it premiered at the Ducal Palace in 1607. Monteverdi's work blends recitative, and recitative, by the way, is the musical declamation used in the narrative and dialogue of an opera. So, Monteverdi's work blends recitative, songs, and instrumental sequences, and it is the earliest surviving opera still performed today. Contemporary accounts report that Monteverdi's opera made his audience sweep because of his ability to express drama and emotion through music, which remains a signature of the form. Through music and song, L'Orfeo retells the story of Orpheus's descent into Hades to find his dead wife Eurydice. A castrato, a man whose voice fell in the same range of sopranos, mezzo-sopranos, and contraltos, because of castration at puberty, sang the lead. The practice of castration on performers would last for 200 years, if you could imagine that. At the time, performances were restricted to the homes and palaces of the aristocracy and royalty, and both ballet and opera traced their origins to these exclusive performances. It took until 1637, when Monteverdi was 70, for the first public opera house to open in Venice, thus broadening opera's reach. So it is not always wars or trade that change the world. Literature, art, and music can also change the world, like in this event. So that was our 45th event. We still have five events to go, so don't go away. And the next event we're going to talk about is the new translation of the Bible. That happened in 1611. In 1604, King James I convened the Hampton Court Conference to authorize a new translation of the Bible for the Church of England, which was founded in 1533 when Henry VIII broke away from Rome in order to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. Having been born out of a personal dilemma, the Church of England initially differed less from the Catholic Church than other Protestant churches. After Henry VIII's death, the Protestant Reformation swooped into England. Church services were conducted in English and church decorations were simplified. The authorized version in 1611, as the King James Bible was called, reflected Reformation ideals. Although not immediately popular with the general public, it was the English translation used in Anglican and Protestant churches by 1750. In the 1800s, it became the most widely printed book in history. So, that was the new translation of the Bible and how it changed the world. Now for our next event, and that is a monument to love. That is the Taj Mahal in India. That's coming next. Well, that happened in 1632. The Taj Mahal, one of the world's architectural masterpieces, had its beginnings after the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan's favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, died during childbirth. Legend says she bound him with a deathbed promise to build her the most beautiful tomb ever known. Promise or no, Shah Jahan poured his passion and wealth into the creation. Construction of the Taj Mahal began in 1632. It is said that 20,000 stone carvers, masons, and artists from across India and as far as Turkey and Iraq were employed under a team of architects to build the shrine. Completed in 1648, it combines Persian, Islamic, and Central Asian architectural styles. The complex, sitting on the lush gardens of the bank of Agra's Yamuna River, houses the tombs of both Shah Jahan and his wife. Its marble reflects the changes of light throughout the day, and the dome, 58 feet in diameter with four minarets, helps give the monument its striking beauty. So, that was a monument to love, the Taj Mahal. That was our 47th event that changed the world. Coming next, the 48th event that changed the world. And that was not a very happy event, to be honest. That was when the Catholic Church puts Galileo on trial. That's coming next.
That happened in 1633. Using the newly invented telescope, the Italian astronomers Galileo Galilei started recording his observations of the moon and other celestial bodies around 1600. This led him to believe that the sun was at the center of the solar system, as Nicolaus Copernicus had theorized more than 50 years earlier. As it had been in Copernicus's time, the notion of a heliocentric universe went against the Catholic Church's teachings. Galileo knew his findings would upset church leaders, but he still went ahead with the Italian publication of his dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, the Ptolemaic and the Copernican, in 1632. Galileo considered science to be distinct from religion, but the church did not. Pope Urban VIII banned the book, seeing it as a personal insult after supporting Galileo in the past. Even Galileo's renowned debating skills couldn't save him from being called to Rome to answer the Inquisition in 1633. Threatened with torture, he renounced the Copernican system. Still, he spent the rest of his life under house arrest. The trial remains one of the world's most celebrated examples of the battle between science and religion. The works of Galileo and Copernicus would remain on the Catholic Church's Index of Forbidden Books until 1835, despite the fact that scientists accepted their ideas in the 17th century. So that was the beginning of this battle between science and the Church, and it was not the last of it, but that was the most famous event, of course, when the Catholic Church puts Galileo on trial. So that was our 48th event. Now for the 49th event. And for this one, we're going way down under. And we're going to talk about Tasman Explores the Great South Land. That's coming next. That happened in 1642. The ancient Greeks first theorized the existence of a great continent in the southern region of the Earth that balanced the inhabited lands of the north. As explorers began tracing the edges of South America and Africa in the 15th century, the so-called unknown southern land receded south on the maps but never quite disappeared. In 1642, the Dutch West Indies Governor General commissioned Dutch navigator Abel Tasman to explore the coast of the Great South Land, which had been seen but not charted. During his two voyages, he reached the island now named Tasmania in his honor, sailed around Australia to prove it was an island, though not believed large enough to be the great southern continent, and reached New Zealand, where he fought with fierce Maori Polynesians who came to the islands by canoe around 1000 AD. Exploration took a backseat to trade during the 17th century. Tasman's sponsors viewed his journeys as failures since he didn't uncover economic wealth, even if he added a lot to the knowledge of the Great South Sea. Some 150 years later, Captain James Cook, commissioned by the British Admiralty, completed the job Tasman started. He claimed Australia and New Zealand for the British crown and sailed into Antarctic waters to the Hawaiian Islands and along the northwest coast of North America. So that was about Tasman exploring the Great South Land. And that was our 49th event. So that leaves us with one event left for this episode. And this last event is about Newton and his famous laws and the publishing of his famous laws in his famous book, Principia. That's coming next. That happened in 1687. In 1687, the English mathematician, astronomer, and physicist Sir Isaac Newton published his theories of natural philosophy based on mathematical principles. Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or Principia for short, gave the world the laws of motion and the law of universal gravitation. Newton's book explained the natural world in mathematical terms and provided a foundation for physics for the next two centuries. First published in Latin, Principia was translated into English in 1729. It contains three books, one on gravitational forces and the laws of motion, one on the motions of fluids, and one on how gravity is proportional to mass. The laws offered principles that could be used to explain any number of actions on Earth and in space. 
They exemplified Newton's ability to explain seemingly contrasting actions using a uniform system. His laws of motion explained the results of Galileo's experiments on falling bodies, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and the ebb and flow of the tides. Newton's understanding of Kepler's laws helped him explain how a centrifugal effect causes the Earth to bulge around the equator as well as the force a body exerts from its center that keeps a body in orbit. Newton's application of his equation for the gravitational force found between two bodies shattered the belief that celestial bodies followed natural laws distinct from those operating on Earth since the force applied to all matter in the universe. It wouldn't be until 1915 and Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity that Newton's explanation of gravity was altered. In describing Newton's genius, Einstein said, Nature to him was an open book whose letters he could read without effort. Newton was one of the greatest thinkers of the scientific revolution that happened somewhere between 1500 and 1700. In the 150 years or so after Nicolaus Copernicus's publication of On the Revolution of Heavenly Bodies in 1543, modern science emerged, and developments in mathematics, physics, astronomy, biology, and chemistry transformed views of society and nature. Major figures of this period include German astronomers Johannes Kepler, who conceived of the laws of planetary motion, French philosopher René Descartes, whose discourse on method laid out the foundation for modern philosophy, Dutch mathematician Christian Huygens, who proposed the wave theory of light, and Anglo-Irish philosopher and chemist Robert Boyle, whose Boyle's law described the properties of air pressure. Before this time, philosophy and religion tangoed with science, often resulting in laws that had not been tested in any empirical way. Newton pioneered a new system, carefully observe a phenomenon from a hypothesis about its behavior, test it by applying known theories, and develop new hypotheses based on the results. Sir Francis Bacon had advocated for the importance of collecting data, and Galileo had practiced the tenets of the scientific method. But by describing his experimental method in his 1704 work, Optics, Newton laid the groundwork for scientists to exponentially increase their knowledge. In the 18th and early 19th centuries, academics followed his model to study heat, electricity, magnetism, and chemistry, building their own theories on top of his formidable advancements. So, that was our last event for today's episode, but that's not the last event in the series. We still have 50 more events, and every week we're going to learn about 10 new events. And don't forget, as I told you that, I'm bringing back the series, and this is not the only one that we're going to talk about. We're going to have two different series. One that is going to talk about a very interesting and intriguing topic, which is about the mysteries around the world. 100 greatest mysteries. And another one that should concern everybody, and that is to learn more about your body and brain. Don't forget to take the link you can find in the description of this episode that will take you to the custom post I created for this episode on my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. And there you will have a chance to see an overview of what we talked about. But more importantly, you will have a quiz there to check your understanding. So if you're just here to learn and have fun, that's fine. You don't have to go to the website. But if you want to take it a step further and just check if you really understood everything I talked about today, if you can remember, well, it's not going to be a difficult quiz. It's going to be a general quiz. Don't worry about that. Just go and test the quiz out. Test your knowledge on what we just talked about. And there's the second link in the description that will take you to my Patreon page. Take the link, go to my Patreon page and support this learning community. We want this learning community to continue, but it is not going to happen without your support. I am waiting for your support. I need more supporters before the end of the year to be able to continue creating new content and even more. I have a lot more coming your way, but first we need to make sure that we are able to continue. So help me out, save this learning community. And it is not only me that's going to be grateful. The whole learning community is going to be grateful. And also one more thing before I leave you, don't forget about topics. I added topics to my website. So if you go to the website and if you are interested in some of the topics I talk about in English Plus more than others, 
You can choose the topic you want and you will find all the episodes on this specific topic so you can listen to them instead of just searching in the feed, which might be a little bit difficult since today is episode 619. So we have a lot of episodes. It might be difficult to search for the episodes you need, especially for this one series. If you want to go back to episode one, two, three, and four, this is episode five in the series. So if you want to go back and see all those episodes, it's a piece of cake. Just go to the website in the topics menu, or you can also find it on the homepage. You can click on series and you will be able to easily access all the episodes we have on series in case you missed the first four episodes of this series. With that being said, I would like to thank you very much for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny. I will see you next time.